Content warning. This episode contains discussion of homophobia, violence, and murder. Dr. Devon Hoover was beloved. He was a successful neurosurgeon, highly regarded by his colleagues and patients. A pillar of the Detroit community, he was a man dedicated to his career, as well as the preservation of his city's history. He was also a dedicated, generous friend to many. All of that makes the mystery of what happened to him so baffling. See, Dr. Hoover was murdered in his beautiful Detroit mansion this past spring. On April 23, 2023, police did a welfare check at his house in Detroit's grand and historic Boston Edison District. Dr. Hoover had missed an event with his family back in Indiana. A Hoosier by birth, Dr. Hoover grew up on his family's farm in Elkhart, Indiana. After attending Indiana University School of Medicine, he did his residency at Detroit's Henry Ford Hospital. After practicing for 27 years, he'd become one of the top neurosurgeons in the city, specializing in neck and back issues. Dr. Hoover was known to be an organized, compassionate man. Missing a family event without giving word just was not like him. Inside the mansion, police made a horrific discovery. Dr. Hoover was dead. He had been left in the attic crawl space of his home, draped in a comforter, sheet, and a rug, according to the Detroit Free Press. His killer had shot him behind his right ear and in the back of his head. He was naked aside from a single black sock. The Wayne County Medical Examiner's Office found that his body had been dragged face down to the spot where he was abandoned. His homicide has received international press coverage. In the early days, police indicated that a person of interest had even been taken into custody. Still, all these months later, no one has been named or charged with Dr. Hoover's murder. That person of interest was let go. Everyone who cared about Dr. Hoover has been left to mourn without concrete answers. We've long been interested in this case. Recently, we were fortunate enough to get to speak with Brian Douglas. He knew Dr. Devon Hoover. Now, he's advocating for answers, both online and in real life. We'll talk with him about the case, his view of how the investigation is going, and his memories of the terrific man who was lost this past April. My name is Anya Kane. I'm a journalist. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. I'm an attorney. And this is The Murder Sheet. We're a true crime podcast focused on original reporting, interviews, and deep dives into murder cases. We're The Murder Sheet. And this is The Murder of Dr. Devon Hoover. Just as a note, a few times in the talk with Brian, I may have mispronounced the victim's name. We apologize for this oversight. It's Dr. Devon Hoover. Listen, the reason I speak about this to anybody is because I want this to always be on the news until whoever did this is in jail. They, they, did, they, did, they did this community, not only this community that's the greater Detroit wrong, but the gay community is also devastated. We weren't close. It's weird because we knew each other mutually through mutual friends and mutual social events, but we never got close. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was kind of like a a missed opportunity of several times of almost being in each other's world, but we never got close like that. He was close with other friends of mine who we were mutually close with. with, Does that make any sense? Yeah, it does. It does. So that's how I knew him. And then eventually I came across him on Grindr and um, I thought 
we almost hooked up a few months before he was murdered, and that freaked me out. Like, really freaked me out. So. Uh, well, well, can you tell us uh, a little bit about him? Um, well, the, well, it's really weird. How I knew him was I met him several times in the late 90s, and then I started waiting on him at a restaurant I worked at called La Dolce Vida in Detroit. He would come in there fairly frequently from 2001 to 2004, but then I left in 2004, so I didn't wait on him anymore. But I, it was, it, I don't know how to explain this. It's kind of like a family environment restaurant. Like, we all have known each other for 20 years, so I'm always stopping in there to say hi, and I would always see him and say hi. So he was just one of those down-earth dudes that you wouldn't even know he was a doctor, let alone a neurosurgeon, unless he told you. He just didn't want himself like that. Very down-to-earth and just an easygoing, cool type person. Can you tell us a bit more about the the sort of gay community and gay culture um, in the greater Detroit area before this horrible thing happened and just kind of contextualize us for, um, you know, listeners who may not be familiar? Well, yeah, I can tell you about the gay community. I've been in this community now since 95. Well, first off, you got to understand Detroit. Detroit is surrounded by a bunch of suburbs, and most of the suburbs are all white at one time. Now it's more mixed than it was. 20, 30, even 15 years ago. Um, and Detroit is on the upswing of development, especially in the core area where Devon lives. There's nothing but a ton of money being poured into that area. I know because my grandparents lived two blocks off that area on um, Calvert. And we watched that area decline because they moved in there from the, they moved in there in the late 40s. And they've been, they're still there. Well, except for my dad's people, they're, they're all but the houses are still there, is my point. And Devon was a part of that. He was a part of that change for Detroit in a better way. And he did that on his own. One year at a time for 15 years once he moved into Boston Edison. Let's pause here for a moment to talk about Detroit's Boston Edison area. Since we are not from Detroit, we wanted to actually come and see the place for ourselves before we reported on it. We drove through the neighborhood on a very misty morning in late April this past year. It was lovely. We saw tree-lined streets and expansive green lawns and gardens, leading up to huge, historic homes. And the tree-lined streets, kind of one of those things where there's a divider in the middle that has like some trees and tulips. And again, we're on 100 Boston in Detroit. Online, we also got some insight into Dr. Hoover's dedication to his historic house. I was able to pull up a report from Detroit's Historic District Commission concerning the Benjamin Siegel home, where Dr. Hoover lived. See, back in 2022, Dr. Hoover wanted to erect a greenhouse on his property, and he needed to get permission from authorities before he began making any changes. As a brief historical interlude, Benjamin Siegel was a wealthy man who owned the B. Siegel department store that existed in downtown Detroit. Now, this is not Bugsy Siegel. That's a different man who also happens to share the same name. Benjamin Siegel's namesake home in Detroit was built in 1915 and was designed by architect Albert Kahn. The mansion itself is 13,000 square feet, with a property sprawling over two acres The Historic District Commission ended up recommending approval, with a few conditions, for Dr. Hoover's proposal. Dr. Hoover first bought the property in 2008. He spent much of his free time hunting for antiques to fill up his historic house. Back in 2012, the website Untapped Cities received access to the property. The photographs from that tour are beautiful and showed detailed woodworking on the home's staircase, a parlor with historic sofas and chairs, and ornate stained glass windows. Photographer Sarah Sharp wrote of Dr. Hoover. The current owner is a remarkable example of a special kind of Detroiter, one who can look through decades of attrition and still see beauty, potential, and most importantly, a history worthy of preservation. That he is additionally devoted to sharing his beautiful home with like-minded people 
is the icing on the cake. Adi and I both appreciate historical preservation. And so we applaud the fact that Dr. Hoover was putting his money back into his community. In press reports, it's even been noted that he allowed neighbors to access his home for different events. As far as the gay community, it, it used to be super segregated. It is still kind of segregated. Like the white play with the white and the black play with the black. And Devon was attracted to more black men. So Devon was around a lot more black gay men than he was his his gay counterpart and there's a weird dynamic with that too a lot of racism when that happens on both parts on both sides Mm -hmm. so and i think that's one of the reasons why people are being kind of quiet about that situation but in my mind things shouldn't be quiet about when a man's been murdered people need to be running their mouths and talking what what do you think about the job uh, that Detroit is doing with the investigation of this case? Initially, because someone close Earth to the bond had put out on that Justice Facebook page, um, I'm not going to say false information on purpose, but they, I think they were, it was through the, fil- the filter of grief. So their perception of what was going on was not correct. So I thought that initially I thought that it was someone was being bought out in police because that's happened before, or um, they were n- neglecting it because it was a gay homicide. But the DPD is completely a different organization than what I experienced in the 90s and that, the early 2000s. Because I used to run after hours uh, right next to a Dutch Vita where Devon would come into. So I know everybody in the gay community, and they, they all know me as well. I don't hang out in the gay community as much as they do every weekend because it just gets kind of tedious. But for the most part, it's a, it's a, it's a small segmented group of bars and places where we all go. Is this case a big topic of conversation amongst the gay community? It was when it first happened. And it was probably about, about a month after that. Now it's just like people are just kind of like going on with their lives. Because there's no, there's no news coming out of the, um, the actual official police channels. In talking with us, Brian alluded to another member of the Justice for Dr. Devon Hoover Facebook group who has been vocal advocating for Dr. Hoover. We've not been able to get into contact with this individual, so we're not going to name him to be on the discreet side. But anyways... This friend talked about attending a meeting of the Detroit Board of Police Commissioners in August. He was the one that suggested it. He wanted a bunch of us to show up. So then I was like, I'm just going to put it on his justice page. And we all, if, if a bunch of us show up. A few of Dr. Hoover's friends went to the meeting. They asked for updates on the case, according to WXYZ and asked for the Detroit Police Department to bring in the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Detroit Police Chief James White had an interesting response. We are very confident we are going to bring this family justice. We are confident that we are aware of circumstances. We are confident in our suspect. We just need a little bit more time to work with the prosecutor's office, and we have a to-do list and we're prepared to make an announcement before snow hits the ground. We just have a lot of work to do. I always wanted to keep it in front of the police department's face, like, this is more important. I understand you all think everybody deserves justice. I get that 1,000%, and that is correct. But this particular man deserves a little more attention because he really was a good person. And he really did a lot of good just for just his general life. Can, can you talk about that? What about him made him so special? Well, you got his effect on all his patients. Like every everybody I've talked to, and they actually met one of his patients, Jan. She, I mean, she feels like a surrogate mother kind of like to him. And she just feels like she has that motherly love for him. And she's literally not letting this go either. You've got all his coworkers. They reached out and they just, they're, they're all like, they're beyond hurt. They're 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 that void is for real. That 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 grief is is tangible. And you don't have something somebody like that 
give off that from just being a patient for a few months to years and as they are as a person that 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 quality of goodness just isn't real. It's not authentic. It's, that is so authentic and it's so genuine. And you, I, I've only come across that in maybe three or four people in my life. Just love for humanity and that's what he had. I'm curious, you know, since you've been doing advocacy in this case, do you have any theories about what happened to Devin or anything like that? The only theory that I didn't go with was everybody was walking around town saying it was a grinder hookup gone bad. At first, I initially thought that, but then, like, when there was, like, I was, like, bodies being wrapped up and moved, and I was like, no, no, somebody who's, like, angry like that, they just kill somebody, they're not moving nobody. They're going to drop you, and you drop where you drop, and it's, it's laissez-faire. F you, I don't care about your life, and you're dead now. Mm -hmm. That's the end of it. And they're not moving your body anywhere. They're not wrapping you up. They're not making things look a certain way so that people look that way, and that's what it is. And I was just like, that's not right. And then I was like, and Devon's been a gay man, openly gay, since the same amount of time I've been, or maybe a little less. But he was a high-functioning professional. Like, Mm -hmm. you don't get more functional than a neurosurgeon that's higher ranking than an attending in a hospital. Like that's something to be said about the man's character. And he was a workaholic. Like, I, like the two of his coworkers at talked to him said he worked a minimum of 12 hours a day. And then you could reach him at all times because he cared about it. That's how he cared about his patients. That his patients could call him whenever they wanted to. I mean, that, just shows you the type of person he was. I know doctors, you can't even reach them if through their voicemail and they don't get back to you for three days, four days. Yeah, that that's really well said. Thank you. That reasoning makes a lot of sense because it it doesn't sound like it's in his, you know, typical mode of operation to No. Yeah. It's not in his DNA. And you can just see it if you just if you just look around and say stuff. It, it was really disheartening for me when I first realized he, he was murdered, and I was looking on looking around just trying to find information. And there was a whole bunch of private stuff coming out, and it was private stuff that was grains of truth, but not solid truth. And I'm like, this is somebody feeding these people this information. This is not this is not just some vacuum of somebody looking at his life and going, oh, I know about that. How would you know that? You would not know how he he did things in his private time unless you were in there. So who's feeding these people this information? And then they're distorting that to make it make him look as vile as a human being as he can look because people know that when people hear about murders and sex involved or drugs, they lose interest in that murder. Devon Hoover was not a drug user and Devon Hoover Yes, he had a social life, but he's a gay man. And I'm going to tell you something. We are, as gay men, especially the older generation, and I am that generation. The mom was born in 69. I was born in 71. We're the same generation. We had to put the gay community back from scratch because the gay community was decimated after AIDS. So we just went by what we saw and what we experienced and, and kept it kept it moving while we're doing our own lives. Do you think the police or the public are looking at this differently because he was a gay man? Do you think there's some homophobia going on? I initially thought that. I do not know. My initial thoughts um, right around June were, this must be some homophobic BS going on. But that was based off of certain people were saying that was there the night of the murder in that group. And I was like, is this? what's happening is this homophobic shit on top of the murder and plus the murder itself, which may have been some type of homophobia, but I don't think that now after, after sitting in that commissioner's meeting and the way the chief chief white turned and looked at his lead detectives and they looked at each other, they are, they are just as committed and, and they understand the gravity of who they killed, who was murdered as much as we do. So that, that, 
that laid my doubts to rest when I was sitting there and I watched their, their actual physical presences. Because you lose stuff. You lose nuances of human connections through the internet and you lose it through uh, visual TV without actually being there. There's, there's just things not, not communicated. That when you're there in front of someone's presence and it's said and done, there's aspects to that truth that are communicated that wouldn't be otherwise. So I, I think they are literally on it, which made me feel a lot better, a lot better. Absolutely. Um, you mentioned some of the misinformation being fed to the public at different times. Is there any misinformation that we can debunk about Devon um, here that, uh, you know, kind of has been out there swirling around that we can kind of put to rest? Devon Hoover was not a drug user. Devon Hoover was not in any way, shape or form a racist. I heard that. I was like, what? Who said that? And actually, if anything, he was the opposite of what you would call a racist or term anybody a racist who is a racist. He cared about everybody. He cared about all human beings. And he had an affinity for gay black men that, that he was, was attracted to. And in the gay community, sometimes that's still a negative. And there's a lot of black gay men who he had special relations with and they deserve, their hurt deserves to be acknowledged as well because they are hurting. Because he was special to them. Mm-hmm. It sounds like he was special to uh, a lot of people. Yeah, he was. He really was. He, he even if, like I said, if you'd ever met him just for five minutes, you'd understand the type of person he was. And it was never based off of any airs or any BS. It was just genuinely he was just a, a real person. He came at you as a real person, and you can thank his parents for that because that's what they raised. That's how they raised him as a man as a boy to a man, to be a a genuinely loving human being. I personally thought my logic on it was whoever did this, they isolated him and they knew what they were doing because they did it at such a time that would make his family go through not one grief process, but two. Because his mother was dying of cancer. That's just horrible. I was like, whoever did this, that's beyond disgusting. That's just a level of depravity that I can't even, it just enrages me when I think about it. Do you or any of the people who are in the community surrounding this case, do you have any suspicions on who might have done this or what the reasons might have been? I do have my suspicions, but I'm not releasing them on names because I want to, I want the police to get this person and our person because I think they, they, they had a competency. I don't think they acted alone. We asked Brian to share more about his theories of the case and his experiences as far as Detroit goes. Let me tell you something about that area. I lived in that area when my parents divorced. We moved back from Rosedale Park, back into the Boston Edison, not that particular community, but the cheaper community around it. Mm-hmm which are still beautiful houses, by the way. Everybody acts like it's just beautiful houses on Boston Edison. That entire area, is just, the houses are immaculate. It, they're fantastically large as well. That area was depressed, literally, from the 80s all the way up until, like, I want to say probably 2005, then that's when it started to turn around. And then and now you got a ton of investors in there pouring in a ton of money, and I mean billions of dollars, not just millions. Plus, in the midtown, from from um, uh, the best way I could put it is um, where Henry Ford Hospital is, where Devon did his residency, and the General Motors building, which is now the state police headquarters, all the way up north back to actual Boston, Edison, and um, Chicago, and where most of the development is going on. And we're talking about a ton of money. So... Whoever had something to do with this, maybe it had something to do with property and allocation of property and allocation of assets that were not theirs. I don't know. That's not my job to find that out. What my job is, is to advocate for Devon Hoover as a gay man in Detroit and someone I knew and someone that I cared about and and a whole lot of people knew and cared about. Uh, You mentioned his, his family. Have you had much contact with his family since this happened? I spoke to his sister once. I haven't had any more contact with them. Um, they 
they I heard they're very private people, so I'm trying to respect that and stay out of the the mix of their mix. That makes sense. I have sent some messages to them because I literally had wanted to use the Bond's house as a vigil because again, the man restored one of the most prestigious, beautiful houses in Detroit that that was dilapidated and run down and was not in great shape. And he did it as, as he's being a neurosurgeon for 15 years, he restored that house one room at a time. If that doesn't show you the type of character this man is, nothing will. Yes, absolutely. And surgeons are not known for having a lot of free time. So the fact that he was doing that is very right. impressive. Right. And he hired the best people to do that job. And he, he oversaw it in the best way he could with his time. And then when he had free time, that's all he did. So I just don't understand how people can be like he was afraid of Detroit. He was a he was a phoenix of Detroit. He was a star. He was a rock star. He loved the the bougie, over the top, grandiose stuff. And there's nothing wrong with that. He worked hard. He deserved that. He worked hard. He was a hardworking man, and he was a brilliant man. He had a fantastic brain. All you had to do was talk to him. But he didn't throw it in your face like he was smarter than you and a better human being than you, which a lot of people, especially, I don't know, just a lot of people do that. Yeah. One undercurrent in the commentary around Dr. Hoover's murder is the idea that he was scared of Detroit. Michigan's largest city by population and the Wayne County seat, Detroit has certainly had its share of historic struggles. It's long been characterized by outsiders as a city in decline, owing to economic misfortunes, a falling population, and skyrocketing crime. The numbers on all these fronts have improved for Detroit, however, in recent years. Brian feels that Dr. Hoover was, in fact, part of Detroit's resurgence, a phoenix, as he called him, a man who was dedicated to improving his community and restoring a piece of its history. Brian said Dr. Hoover even loaned friends money for historical restoration projects of their own. He was a generous person. Brian also took the time to clarify a few things about the third floor of Dr. Hoover's house, where he was found murdered. And that's what that's what that third floor up there was. It was, it was a common area. It was a big ballroom and, and two servants' rooms up there. It was a common area. That's where he would treat the house like a, a normal house, like you and me treat our regular house. The first and second floor, except for the kitchen, was a museum. And you can see that in how he did things. It's just like, that's how he did it. That's why he did it the way he did it that way. It was it's pretty uh, spectacular uh, vision. Yeah. You know, and, and doing it one little tick at a time instead of trying to throw a bunch of money at it and He's done with effort and, and love and concern and also a dedicated Detroit that not a whole lot of white people back then in 2008 were doing. That's all I got to say about that. I'm, I'm curious in terms of, um, you know, in terms of the public possibly helping out with this case, um, is there, you know, do you know if there's any information that, answers would be helpful if somebody knows something or like, you know, how we can direct people to also advocate for, for not only Devon, but, but this community. Uh, the biggest thing that I always thought was that if people were around that night and out and about, and, cause that area is pretty active at night. Boston Edison is not, it's huge apartments there. If anybody in those apartments or that, duplex there's two giant apartments that look directly into the bond yard if you had a camera facing that way or you saw something open your mouth it's a thousand percent anonymous and you might get two thousand twenty two thousand five hundred dollars we raised that money all of us all of the people who ever met devon and cared, cared about devon because we just were like a thousand dollars is not enough for this so if anybody knows anything about that open your mouth no one's going to do anything to you and I'm going to tell you something else. A killer's not going to come after nobody else after they didn't kill somebody else once. They'd be awfully stupid because they'd isolate themselves even more for law enforcement to track them down faster. 
Yes. I think that's so important to say because people get freaked out and scared and it's like life is not like a movie that, that really no, doesn't it's happen. Not, it's, it's not, it's not. And that's the thing. Everybody keeps saying, what's the motive? What's the motive? I'm like, you understand it in the court of law. You don't need a motive. All you need is to show the victim and the, the, the perpetrator were together at the time of the murder and no one else was there. And this is the only person that ties into that murder at that time. That's it. That's it. You don't need anything else. So I don't understand what people, you know, they're using terms off of TV shows and it's like, that's a TV show. We're, we're Right now, we're well beyond a TV show of imagination. This is real life. And a real, real incredible man is dead. He shouldn't be dead. And I'm standing here saying that because I'm 52 and I'm still vibrant and alive and quite healthy. So I know he was as, as well quite vibrant and healthy. Yeah, he, he had a lot of living to do. He had a lot of, you know, he had <laughs> work to do and uh, taking care of his patients, being with his friends, being with people who cared about him and doing the right. historical renovation he was doing. It just broke my heart. You know, my, my grandmother used to sit there and she'd say, you know, we moved here. It was so nice. It's just, and I can't go nowhere. I'm, I'm old now. I'm here. And I love this house. And I love, you know, I fact that I had my family here. It broke my heart when I saw what he had did over there on Boston Edison. And that's all my grandmother ever wanted in that area. We asked Brian about other possible misconceptions in the case. He brought up cruising. Cruising refers to searching for casual sexual encounters. In the United States, it's a term that's almost exclusively applied to gay men. I'm going to tell you something. The cruising environment of Detroit was always there, and it was there before we were there because there was a huge amount of closeted people running around Detroit, and it still is. And they, they play with guys on the side, and then they act like they're straight. I don't care about that crap. That doesn't bother me. It, it, it comes with the territory. We all, every last one of us gay men in this world, gay men, I'm not talking about the other communities attached to that. I'm talking about just us gay men. Whatever Devon did in his private time, it was his private time and he, he deserved to be not vilified as a, as a man that did better than most people did in their lives. For people, not just for himself. And I think there's a, a rush to assume that he died because of something risky he did. And I think that's just homophobia. I think that's just because he's a gay man. We should not assume that that. That's the same thing that Chief Craig had said when he did his podcast mm -hmm. on Surviving the Survivor. And he was talking about, oh, a risky behavior. And I was just thinking to myself, what are you talking about? We, what, it's the same thing when we go to a bar. Mm -hmm. it, and, and all of us, we meet each other. We're strangers until we're not. Every last one of us, we are strangers to each other until we are not. So what are you talking about? And on top of that, you can be with somebody for years and they still kill you or murder you. Well said, because it's, it, I mean, how often does domestic violence happen? And you shouldn't be shamed over that. No one's saying, oh, they picked the wrong partner, you know? Every murder is different, but all murders need to be solved. And when it's this, you're getting this outcry from the community because that's just how important he was as a person. And that's just how he touched people. Even if you weren't around him, you knew how good he was. So you, you kept just admiring him from afar. You would look, you would see him and be like, there's that Hoover. There's Devon or Dr. Devon as we knew him back then. We didn't even know his last name. We only knew he was a resident in Henry Ford and we called him Dr. Devon. So it, he, he wasn't, he didn't put on airs and he never made people feel like they were less than him. Never. Not once. I know so many people that walk in restaurants and they make you feel like you're less than them. You're subhuman because you wait tables and all kind of nonsense. And that was not that dude. He worked for it. And he, he did it through sheer genius, sheer effort, and, and just being a fantastic doctor. Better than most, by all accounts. And I'm not trying to make doctors look stupid when I say that. That's patient advocacy for him, not and peers. We, we really appreciate you talking with us. Yeah, this is um, this I, is incredibly helpful. I appreciate you guys reaching out. And like I said, I say what I say because I don't want this out of the media until this person that murdered this man or person are rotting in jail. What they did was, was a layer of horrificness that just it 
it, it grates my soul. Like I tell everybody in the gay community, the police have their job, but it's our job to connect the dots for a man that's been here for the better part of the year. His life was here. He was a great, he was a, a big part of this community. He was a big part of Detroit. And he was, he was a positive helping influence, not, not, not what, what, what's coming out or what's trying to come out. So anyway, thank you. And thank you for reaching out to me. And again, this is for Devon Hoover. He should not be dead. He should be alive and well. Thank you so much for your time and, and, and the energy you're putting into this. Hey, it was, it was for a kid I met in 1998, a, a very beautiful kid. So thank you. We want to thank Brian for talking with us. If you have information or theories on Dr. Hoover's case, please email us at murdersheet at gmail.com. You can also join the Justice for Dr. Devon Hoover group on Facebook. Thanks so much for listening to The Murder Sheet. If you have a tip concerning one of the cases we cover, please email us at murdersheet at gmail.com. If you have actionable information about an unsolved crime, please report it to the appropriate authorities. If you're interested in joining our Patreon, that's available at www.patreon.com slash murder sheet. If you want to tip us a bit of money for records requests, you can do so at www.buymeacoffee.com slash murder sheet. We very much appreciate any support. Special thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenley, who composed the music for the murder sheet and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. If you're looking to talk with other listeners about a case we've covered, you can join the Murder Sheet discussion group on Facebook. We mostly focus our time on research and reporting, so we're not on social media much. We do try to check our email account, but we ask for patience as we often receive a lot of messages. Thanks again for listening.